today is October 7th. We're the third of the four-part noon webinar series, which has been so fun to get to hear from content experts that work for Extension on campus. Um, and we'll be done by one o'clock today. I'm going to do a quick welcome. Uh, Dr. Adam Janke is going to give his presentation, and then we'll make sure to take time for a Q&A um, session as well. And so I just wanted to highlight a couple Master Gardener training things. So some of you are wrapping up the Master Gardener training, um, and pretty soon you're going to get an email from mgardener at iestate.edu. So it's from me. And this is going to have a link for you with a final evaluation tool because we want to hear what you thought about the training and how it went for you. And then you're also going to get a link to the post assessment. And so this is a 100 question open book test uh, that you need to pass before you can uh, officially complete the Master Gardener training. So you can take it as many times as you need to. Um, you need to score 70 out of 100 out of that. And um, most people do great. And you all already took this assessment at the beginning of the Master Gardener training. And I was really impressed by this group because many of them already got above 70. And that was before even participating in the training. Um, and then after you complete that, you'll earn your Master Gardener intern certificate. So this is something that I mailed out to the, the county staff that are organizing your uh, Master Gardener training. And so then after that, you'll get into action as a Master Gardener volunteer. And some of you have reached out because you are already volunteering in your community. So that's amazing if you're already doing that. Feel free to put in the chat if you're already volunteering and what you're jumping into. Um, so you're supposed to log 40 volunteer hours by December 31st, 2021. So you've got over a year to complete that. And you'll log those hours online. So we've got this tool called the Volunteer Reporting System. Good news, all of you are already in it. When you applied for the Master Gardener training, you put yourself in there. Um, so when you go to log in, your username is your email address. So click on forgot password and your email, your password will be emailed to you. And just a little bit about volunteering. Um, so a couple ideas that uh, maybe you're feeling like I am and you're mostly trying to stay home during this COVID world. Um, so maybe you can deliver and participate in educational programming via your computer. So maybe you're helping some other Master Gardener volunteers put on a webinar or maybe you're participating in some project planning virtual meetings with fellow Master Gardener volunteers. Um, or maybe you feel comfortable getting out and you're going to do some no contact gardening activities. So maybe you're wrapping up, um, you're doing some fall garden cleanup for a school garden or a public park or a community garden. So finding ways to follow CDC guidelines and stay safe while you're volunteering. Um, and then after you complete those 40 volunteer hours, then you you get to become a Master Gardener volunteer. This is the website that I mentioned. This is the volunteer reporting system where you log your Master Gardener volunteer hours and eventually log your continuing education hours. And then another shameless plug for the Master Gardener t-shirt and polo shirt. Um, these are just a few photographs. So shout out to Jasper County and Woodbury County that are featured here. Um, and there is a shipping fee when you order t-shirts from the ISU extension store. So maybe you want to do a group order to decrease uh, that shipping fee. So next week we're going to be talking about plant pathology. So um, Dr. Lena Rodriguez Salamanca is going to join us. So make sure to watch that lecture video um, before we connect again. And then, so we're going to get started, Adam. Are you excited to, to connect with everybody? Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. Good. I know you got to be in person last year for a class on campus, so that was fun. Yeah. Yeah, that was a different world, wasn't it? Yeah. But happy to join you all from my house. Cool, cool. So can you share, try it, share in your screen and we'll go from there? All right. How's your dog feel about you 
So she's joining us. She's in the room for the presentation. She's behind. You might see her. Okay. Well, off and running. She's like, I've already heard this all before. So welcome, Adam. We're really excited to have you. Okay, great. Well, folks, I'm really excited to join you and talk to you today. Um, I know the the subject matter that I'm generally presenting on and presented on the Master Gardener online training is animal ecology, which of course includes lots of different things um, related to um, how essentially our landscapes and gardens interact with the natural world around us. Um, sometimes the animal ecology section has to do primarily with how we address the problematic, particularly vertebrates that find their way into our landscapes or gardens. And that's of course an important subject and I hope you learned some stuff in the manual and in the online materials there. Uh, but as a wildlife ecologist, wildlife biologist, and a passionate conservationist, I actually spend most of my time thinking about and doing education on wildlife conservation. And when it comes to wildlife conservation in Iowa, one of the most important things that we can all do, no matter how large the land we have influence over is, is to find ways to increase the abundance and success of native plants. And so that's why the wildlife biologist is going to give you a talk today that I talk almost exclusively about plants. Because plants, of course, are the backbone of our ecosystem and the diversity and resilience of plant communities that we find in the environment is really critical to the success of wildlife and wildlife habitat. And in a state like Iowa, where over 82% of our land area is in some sort of agricultural production, and then uh, about uh, eight or 9% of the land area is in urban spaces. Uh, what we do in the places that we live has a huge impact on the wildlife that we find here. We can't just rely, for example, on natural areas like state parks or forests uh, to provide the wildlife habitat. We all have to do something in our own backyards, in our own gardens, on our farms, or even on our balconies to try to help wildlife. Uh, and the easiest way to do that, particularly for a master gardener, is to be intentional about inclusion of native plants uh, and spreading the good word about the awesome story that native plants have in our ecosystem. So that's what I'm going to talk about today um, and I'm excited to uh, get going on this. I see there's a chat and I just want to kind of make sure, Sue, you can see my slides and everything. Looks great, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, awesome. So we'll get going on this. First, and I guess Introduction for me, I'm a couple of different titles. I'm assistant professor in the Natural Resource Ecology and Management Department at Iowa State, and I'm the Extension Wildlife Specialist as well for Iowa State Extension and Outreach. I do wildlife education and then I do wildlife research, and my wildlife research is all on basically I study where birds live on farms. And uh, so I have a bird bias, you'll hear, you've already heard a little bit of that, and you'll see that throughout the talk, but I talk uh, or am interested just broadly in wildlife habitat. So Enough about me. Um, first, I wanted to start with just this picture, a picture that I took at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge a few summers ago. And what this picture is, of course, is a picture of the tall grass prairie in bloom in July. And we know um, from the online materials you learned that the tall grass prairie, of course, was um, once the most abundant ecosystem in Iowa, over 80% of our land area. And of course, over there's a huge amount of plant diversity found in the tall grass prairie. And so here I'm just clicking through what I can picture, what I can pick up easily in this picture from this one blooming period in July in one tall grass prairie in Iowa. Um, this is just a few of the over 300 species of native flowering plants that have been documented in Iowa's tall grass prairie. And it's a rich environment from which to draw uh, plant diversity that we'll talk about today. Um, here's a picture of Iowa's woodlands. Of course, we know that Iowa's woodlands take up less area or historically took up less area of Iowa and today uh, still take up only about uh, 10 or so percent, percent of the state. Uh, but in the woodlands, of course, we find lots of diversity of plants. And so here's just some examples I'm clicking through to show you some of the pictures that are picked up or some of the plants that I can see very clearly uh, from this photograph of a central Iowa woodland. And then Iowa's last ecosystem is uh, wetland ecosystems and these wetland ecosystems sort of trans the boundaries of, of uh, prairies and forests and here in these wet, wetland or wet environments we find even more native plant diversity of course here's some and then here's just some pictures from this wetland that I took um, in here in central Iowa again just during one time of the year. So the point being here that when we 
talk about a native plant, plant a plant that has occurred here um, for thousands of years, we know that there's just a huge amount of diversity to draw from. And so that's what I want to sort of explore today is the uh, diversity of native plants that we find in iOS environments and why they're so important for wildlife of all different sort of shapes and sizes. And also what some of the neat stories about native plants in Iowa's history uh, we can share with people as we educate them on uh, this rich diversity that we're all blessed with. And so to do this presentation, I'm going to explore seven species of plants. And uh, I'm going to use these seven species of plants to kind of tell the stories or the broad themes that play out in those hundreds of other species of plants that I mentioned that we have here in the state. And so these are the seven plants I'm going to talk about. And this is where we're going to have our first poll of the, of the presentation. I want you all to look at these seven plants and tell me how many native plants do you see depicted here? So awesome. that poll is up. Yeah, so I just started the poll and folks are counting, trying to see which ones of these are native plants. And it looks like about 20% of people have voted. So we'll wait a little bit to close that poll. Okay, people are quickly voting. I'm gonna give a few more seconds and then I'm gonna close it and share the results. So it looks like most people are in the middle when it comes to how many, how many native plants do you see here? Okay, so what the, the results here show, yeah, like Sue said about a normal distribution, we have in the, in the most is 39% saw four species of native plant, 13% of people said all seven were native plants, and one person or one percent of people said there was only one native plant. So we'll save that for the record and then I'll reveal the answer. Uh, there are five species of native plants in this that we're going to explore. These two species, number two and three, are exotic species. And then the rest of these are all native plants. And so what my hope is, is that by the end of the presentation, everybody will be familiar with these seven species, know how to recognize them, and maybe know sort of what makes them uh, unique. And so we're going to do that. I'm going to jump off into a discussion of each one of these plants, one at a time, and what they mean for our environment and for wildlife. And so the first species that I showed you is called butterfly milkweed or butterfly weed. This is one of over 15 species of native milkweeds found in Iowa. Uh, this one, I think we could debate which of the milkweeds are the most beautiful, but for me, I think I go with butterfly milkweed because the brilliance of that orange flower is hardly rivaled by any other native plant in the state. And so there's a picture there uh, in the top right of the butterfly milkweed in bloom with um, adult monarch butterfly on it. And then the picture right in the middle, of course, is the larvae of the monarch butterfly. And I'm sure you all know, but I always like to just talk about the biology of the monarch butterfly, because this is a great example of why it is so important to use native plants in our landscapes and in our backyards. So the monarch butterfly larvae, pictured here in one of its latest growth stages before it turns into a chrysalis and then an adult, uh, feeds exclusively on milkweeds. And I mentioned there's about 15 species of milkweeds or 15, 17, somewhere in there native to Iowa. Butterfly milkweed is one of the most common. Common milkweed is the most common. Swamp milkweed and world milkweed are also some, some that you could regularly find. But there's some really interesting, unique varieties as well that you can find resources online to learn about. The monarch butterfly uh, evolved a life history to rely exclusively on the milkweed because when native plants are consistently found in an environment, species can develop these really fascinating life histories. And so the fascinating life history of the Eastern population of the monarch butterfly is that it spends its summers here in the Midwest primarily in the area that's circled with that white dashed line. We know the vast majority of the eastern population of monarch butterfly is found in what we today call the Corn Belt, where historically tall grass prairie was the dominant ecosystem. And then through a series of generations, the monarch migrates from 
well, a single generation of monarchs migrates from Iowa to a mountainside in Mexico, shown there in, in, with the blue star. And then through a series of generations, it migrates back up into Iowa and our neighboring states, all the while feeding its larvae on milkweeds and its adult form on the nectar of flowering plants and then repeats the process every year. It's an absolutely fascinating life history. And this is why native plants are so important is because that this sort of complex life history can't exist without reliable, reliably being able to find plants in the environment. So here's just a picture of that life stage process that was sort of created. You can see that it, they start from an egg laid on a milkweed by an adult. They come into their first instar stage, a small sort of unrecognizable caterpillar, and then advance into these really charismatic uh, later instars and then into a chrysalis. This is the stage where the monarch wears its crown, as we say, with this golden uh, crown on the chrysalis and then it emerges as an adult. Now we know monarchs were, were historically quite abundant in Iowa. Uh, owing to the fact that our landscapes were really suitable for the migration and reproduction of monarchs during the summertime. This is a quote from a, a settler in the 1860s that just has written history that we have on the abundance of monarchs. And they talk about, um, the settler account here says that essentially the tree rows were turning orange because of the abundance of monarchs during their migration. And this was not seen in one grove alone, but in all those which were visited about the middle of September. So a really remarkable uh, uh, phenomenon in nature that is rather unique to Iowa's tall grass prairie ecosystems and thanks to butterfly milkweed, our first plant, and many other species of milkweeds. The next species that we want to profile is the is our first exotic species, and this is called Chinese silver grass. This is in the Miscanthus genus, and uh, you'll see this named lots of different things, plume grass, uh, Asian silver, silver grass, and Chinese silver grass, among other things. This is a, a common landscape plant that you'll see, and what the picture that I have shown here provides a really nice contrast to the tall grass prairie that we started with, and you can see that this roadside has been invaded by Chinese silver grass, and it's a complete monoculture. So imagine if you're a monarch butterfly flying through this landscape where there's a soybean field in the background in a complete monoculture of, of uh, Chinese silver grass or just mowed turf grass. There's no way, no place to lay an egg. There's no place for larvae to survive on milkweeds. And there's certainly no place for adults to find nectar to fuel their migrations. And so this is why, this is the challenge that exotic plants present for our environment is because in the absence of predators, things that want to eat them or, or um, uh, diseases that affect their growth or survival, plants from far away places can thrive in our, um, in our climates and in our soils. And that's shown very clearly here with what we call a monoculture of Chinese silvergrass where no native plants can outcompete and survive and thus uh, wildlife and other species struggle. You'll notice that that name was Chinese silver grass, and this is a rather consistent theme that we see with exotic species that do well in Iowa. So this is from a scientific paper published by Dr. Jeff Isles and a student that he worked with a few years ago, and they were studying non-native woody plants. So these are um, exotic uh, shrubs that have done well in Iowa. And you can see the number of non-native woody plants that have established and become invasive in Iowa. The vast majority of them come from similar latitudes and similar climates, but separated by a continent. And so when we talk about Chinese silvergrass, it's not surprising that a species from China, uh, a species of grass from China can thrive in Iowa's climates and soils because in the places where it came from are environmentally very similar, but they were historically separated by an ocean. The uh, globalization of both trade and horticulture exchanges have created scenarios where those oceans are no longer relevant. And these exotic species are either planted intentionally or they're transplanted here 
um, accidentally, for example, on shipping containers, and they can thrive in the absence of their native predators found an ocean away. And that's the challenge that invasive or exotic plants create for iOS environments and our wildlife. And so that's definitely true of our third species in our exploration today. And our third species is, is native to that range that I was talking about with similar climate, but an ocean away. This is the exotic species of burning bush. This is a really common landscape plant. It does really well in our environments. And so many times species that are, have desirable characteristics for landscapes, exotic species that have desirable characteristics for landscapes, make them very prone to invasion in natural environments because they don't have many natural pests. That means they're easy to keep alive in the landscape and they do well in our soils and climates, also easy to keep alive in our landscape. And exotic species of burning bush are a great example of that. And they, although planted around our homes and in our gardens, that may seem rather benign, uh, birds quickly take the fruits of burning bush and deposit them out in our natural areas. And the species in the absence of natural predators can grow and outcompete. And that was the case this picture is from Des Moines County, this forest in the background. And this was a forest in southeastern Iowa in Des Moines County that was being invaded by burning bush, the exotic species of burning bush. Not because anybody planted it there, but because the birds picked it up in the cities where it was planted and deposited it here in these natural areas. And in the absence of predators, it's taken off and become very problematic. And so that's the case for burning bush, the exotic species. And you notice I've been going out of my way to say that. Note that I have the scientific name here, Euonymus altus. And that's the exotic or winged, winged burning bush is another name. We have a native species of burning bush. And this is what can sometimes make these nuances or distinctions rather challenging. And so, for example, this is our fourth species you see it shares the same genus as that exotic species of burning bush. And it even shares the same common name, burning bush. But in this case, our native species of Euonymus, Euonymus atropurpureus, as I pronounce it, I don't know if that's exactly right in the Latin, um, is, has similar characteristics. It has an absolutely beautiful fluorescent pink fruit. And it uh, turns the same bright red colors. But because it has natural predators and has a little bit different growth form, we haven't seen it adapted or used very widespread in our landscapes. And we have um, seen this species be reduced considerably by a number of factors, including other invasive species in the woodland. And so I'd be curious if anybody on the call has um, uh, seen this native species of burning bush. I know that Polk County Master Gardeners keep uh, at least one in a garden that I visited in, uh, in and around Des Moines. And it's a really beautiful species of native species uh, in contrast to that exotic one. We're gonna pause here. Susan just turned her camera on. We're gonna pause midway through our exploration of those seven species and kind of check in. Yeah, um, I know the, the some folks were wondering about pompous grass versus Chinese silvergrass, and it looks like pompous grass isn't the same thing. Uh, it can be. There's a lot of different uh, names. Pompous grass can be, it's, it's, I know it's in the Miscanthus genus, and I think it might be the same species. That kind of gets oh, okay. into the names, but yeah, it can be a problematic invasive, and it's definitely not a native. And, and last year, last week, we were talking about um, species identification. And so what you talked about of like these like tiny details can get really important. Um, yeah. and, and that's a skill worth developing is understanding how to tell a native species from an exotic species. You will definitely, I'm, I'm probably the exception at Iowa State, the person that's sort of beating the drum of native species only. If you talk to ecologists like me, we really emphasize the importance of everybody using native species. You won't hear the same message or a consistent message from horticultural experts. Um, that, and, and my theory on that is I work in the natural areas and I see the harm that exotic species do all the time. 
And I think oftentimes horticultural experts don't get out into those areas where I work with the animals that I study uh, and see that harm. And so uh, if you only work in the city, a species like burning, burning bush is beautiful in the fall, especially this time of year. And uh, why not plant that there? You'd have to leave and find it where it becomes problematic in a natural setting and see the harm that it does to sort of appreciate that. So there's differences in opinions there. It sounds like you you definitely made a sale and people want to find out where can I buy the native burning bush? So I see a couple of questions here in the Q&A. Is brome grass also an issue? It definitely is. Now brome grass is not commonly planted in landscapes, but it can be uh, rather challenging to get plant diversity in stands of brome grass. And that's because uh, brome grass is an exotic cool season sod forming grass. And so exotic, of course, just means it lacks a lot of natural predators that we have for our native grasses. And also most of our native grasses are what we call bunch grasses. So they grow in clumps and then flowers grow in between them. And that always worked well uh, in the absence of really competitive sod farmers. But uh, the exotic species that we tended to bring in with European settlement were primarily sod farming grasses that were good for forage or good for quick, easy establishment of monocultures. And uh, brome grass is an example of one, reed canary grass is an example of another, and uh, lots of other examples. And I I did share the um, link in the chat box of the Natural Resources Extension Invasives page for folks to dive deep to. Great, thanks. Um, A couple other questions, are all varieties of milkweed helpful? Absolutely, especially the native ones. There are some places you can buy exotic species of milkweed. Uh, and we discourage people from doing that and encourage you to find the species that are native to Iowa. And Xerces Society, which Xerces with an X, uh, is a society for invertebrate conservation. They have a wonderful resource of the native Midwestern milkweeds out there that I think would be a great starting point. Um, Some other questions about pompous grass and Chinese silvergrass. It is problematic, especially around an aquatic environment. In fact, the places that I've seen the worst invasions of Chinese silvergrass are places where you can see that uh, it was brought in along a stream from probably an upstream neighbor that again, planted it sort of benignly in their landscape. Um, And so, yeah, I would definitely, I like to definitely discourage planting exotic species in and around aquatic environments as well. Um, Should we keep going on questions, Susan, or should we, I'm happy to keep That's up to you. If you want to go back to your slides and then we'll see more questions come through. And I did share the Xerxes Society link that you mentioned. Great. Okay. Why don't we jump back into the slides? I appreciate all these questions and I think we're going to be able to get to most of them because I have uh, let's see, we, we're on plant number five and we're trying to get to seven. So we don't have a ton of additional plants to get through. So we can do that and I'll just... Okay, and you can still see my slides? Yep, looks great. Great, okay. So our fifth species, and now we're uh, back to the native species. Our fifth species is a pick, is a plant that I have planted in my landscape here in my house in Ames, and that's called button bush, uh, Cephalanthus occidentalis. And this is a really neat native species, woody plant uh, that grows primarily in wet areas. But where I have it planted actually in my yard, a horticultural variety of Cephalanthus occidentalis um, grows just fine in a rather dry spot. Um, this button bush is a host for over 18 species of butterfly and mar- moth larvae in North America, including this really neat Titan Sphinx moth uh, that's pictured here that looks like a hummingbird, um, but flies around uh, and feeds on nectar of flowering plants uh, and is actually a moth. And so this is just a point that I wanted to make here, and we'll talk about this again with some other species is that one of the main arguments for the importance of native species in our landscapes and in our um, uh, natural spaces is because primarily of insect adaptations. And insects form the basis of the food chain in many of these uh, environments. Well, plants form the basis of the food chain and then insects are what many vertebrates that I study like birds feed on. And so of course, 18 species of butterfly and moth take advantage of button bush. 
in those 18 species of butterfly and moth larvae as caterpillars can be really important for the survival of songbirds. And so we always say that songbirds essentially just eat caterpillars all summer long. That's not true of all of them, for sure. Some catch insects out of the air and some uh, even eat some seeds and fruits and things like that. But primarily, young songbirds are raised with caterpillars. And caterpillars are raised on native plants like buttonbush. And so this is a, a figure from a scientific paper uh, from a study out east where they don't have black cap chickadees like we do. Well, they do, but they were studying Carolina chickadees, which are just like our black cap chickadees. And what they found in this study is that backyards that had more non-native plants fledged fewer young every year. And so the opposite of this would be backyards with abundant native plants would fledge many more young of Carolina chickadees every year. And the reason, of course, is because those backyards that have more native plants are backyards that have more caterpillars. Backyards that have more caterpillars are going to fledge more young because they have a better diet and they're able to survive and grow faster until they can leave the nest as fledglings. And so this is just one example of many examples we see playing out in our environment where it's really important to have diverse native plants that can feed the diverse native wildlife that we find there. So our sixth species of plant keeps on this theme of supporting insects, and that is our state tree, the oak, generally. And then specifically, the picture that I have is a bur oak or Quercus macrocarpa, so named for the large fruit, macro meaning large and carpa meaning fruit in Latin, uh, pictured there in the top left. Oaks are the winners as it relates to hosting uh, species of butterflies and moth. They hands down host the richest diversity of butterfly and moth larvae and are really critical uh, for supporting the insect food web in many of these communities. It, they are also really important for lots of other uses like um, uh, providing food for wildlife in the form of acorns all uh, winter long and also providing lots of structure and defining the key structure of Iowa's forested environment. So oaks are really unique uh, and really critically important. And oaks also help us explore the other challenge that exotic species uh, and using exotic species and landscapes present. And that is where shipment of exotic species around the country and around the world can lead to the introduction of exotic pathogens that cause problems for native plant species. And so here's an example of a headline from just last year where nursery plants were um, the source of sudden oak death, a, path, a pathogen that affects native species of oaks, the nursery stock was the source of that. And so we, when we talk about native plants, it's important to also talk about uh, considering what the impact of trade in exotic plants can have on the native species that are in our environment. Maybe we don't even find, maybe we plant benign exotic species in our landscape, but if they're the source of an introduction of exotic fungal pathogen or an exotic pest, then they can also poise, uh, present problems for our natural environment. So that's one other example. We have an amazing diversity of oaks here in Iowa. And so the, our next quiz, I mentioned the oak is the state tree of Iowa. Uh, and so our next quiz is how many species of oaks are are native to Iowa. Awesome, so the poll is up and folks are putting in their answers. Okay, it looks like most people have voted, so I'm gonna close it down in about five seconds. All right, here's the results. Okay. So the results, 2% of people said 2, 24% of people said 4, 17% of people said 6, 32 said 8, 8% 8 said 10, and 17% were right and said 12. We have 12 different species of oak found in Iowa. 
Um, that's what's depicted here on this slide. Um, I think uh, Susan mentioned that uh, Dr. Haynes, I think, talked about red oak versus white oak and distinguishing their characteristic. They have different uh, chronology of acorn development and flowering, and then their, their leaves look different. Uh, and so we break them up into the red oak and white oak group. And here's an accounting of all the different species of oaks that we find uh, in the state. Only one of these species is found in northwestern Iowa, if you're calling in from Lyon County, uh, and that's the bur oak, or at least native up there. It's a much more rugged environment, a hard place to be a tree in arid northwestern Iowa, whereas southeastern Iowa, where they get, we get all that Gulf Coast precipitation and a little further from the rain shadow uh, of the Rocky Mountains, we find all uh, 12 of these species of oaks down there in southeastern Iowa. So we have a gradient of oak abundance across the state, but we definitely have this rich diversity of oaks found across Iowa, which is pretty neat. So I mentioned that um, oak is Iowa's state flower or state tree, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it's generic just to include all different species of oaks. Uh, the next uh, and final plant in our exploration of uh, native plants through the lens of just seven species is prairie rose, and that's our state flower. And so uh, the state designation as prairie rose as the state flower doesn't explicitly state one species of prairie rose, and we do find a couple of different species of uh, rose native to Iowa's environments. Um, but the one that I have pictured here we call prairie rose, Rosa arc. Arkansas, well, whatever, I'll spare you my attempt at Latin. Um, and so it's one of many species of native rose found in Iowa. The reason the rose was named Iowa State Flower is a pretty neat story. In the late 1800s, uh, they were christening a new battleship called the USS Iowa. And when they had these new battleships, they would have a silverware set commissioned for the ship itself. And the silverware was designed to represent the state from which it came and sort of honor the naming of the battleship. And so on this silver that you can see in the State Historical Society in Des Moines uh, on display, that's what this picture's from, they put, they featured the prairie rose uh, on the silverware along with an ear of corn, which is suiting, uh, and a couple of other sort of, uh, an eagle and a couple of other sort of uniquely Iowa things. And so at the time that this um, rose was designated as the state flower, this poem was what re read on the state house floor. And I think it's just a really neat poem that shows what native plants can mean to identifying and connecting to a place like we all identify and connect to Iowa. So I'm going to take the time to read this poem here uh, to you all. Has seen the wild rose of the west, the sweetest child of the morn, its feet the dewy fields have pressed, its breath is on the corn. The gladsome prairie rolls and sweeps like billows to the sea, while on its breast the red rose keeps the white rose company. The wild, wild rose whose fragrance dear to every breeze is flung, the same wild rose that blossomed here when Iowa was young. O oh, sons of heroes ever wear the wild rose on your shield, no other flower half so fair in love's immortal field. Let others sing of mountain snows or palms beside the sea, the state whose emblem is the rose, the fairest far to me. I think I like to share that poem when I talk about this species of native plant to emphasize the unique nature of connecting to the plants that we share our spaces with. And that's what I think is so neat about native plants. Not only do they host the richest diversity of uh, native moths and butterflies that feed the birds, that uh, enrich our experiences in our backyards. These plants are also the plants that are resilient, connected to these lands in the same way that we are connected to Iowa in these, uh, these places. So I love how this poem wraps up. The state whose emblem is the rose, the fairest far to me. Uh, and I always like to share that. So I shared with you the seven species uh, that help sort of tell the story and explore the nature of native plants in Iowa. We talked about some of the challenges that exotic species present uh, and talked about some of the neat um, cases of native plants. Of course, now we only talked about 
um, five native plants out of what I told you was a list of hundreds. So there's a lifetime of learning to be had uh, with Iowa's native plants. But I wanted to sort of wrap up with what you can do to uh, impact wildlife and wild places in any, uh, anything you do on the land. And so here's my four tips for what you can do to help wildlife and wild places uh, in anywhere that you touch. The first obviously is to choose native plants. I talked about what a native plant was, but some of those definitions, there's some nuance there and you can find lots of good resources online to um, find what species are native to where, primarily through the USDA plants database. Shop and harvest locally, um, that's good for lots of reasons. It supports our local economy and creates jobs and all that cool stuff that we're excited about here at Iowa State Extension and Outreach. But it's also really important to try to get our seeds as from as seeds or plants from as close to home as we can so that we're minimizing the risk of moving those exotic pathogens or exotic plants uh, further than they would be able to move naturally. And so that's the example with oak wilt. And there's been other examples with introduction of exotic species through uh, purchasing seeds from far away. So the more local, uh, the better. The next thing I like to emphasize is you don't need to go out in your backyard. I'm not telling you to go out in your backyard and cut down everything that isn't a native plant. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do, but I think we could start small by being intentional about choosing native plants anytime we introduce them. Uh, and we could uh, work up from there. I like to always sort of, when I talk about this, imagine a scenario where every seed that leaves the city in the digestive tract of a bird which is, I told you, the primary way that exotic plants become problematic. Um, what if it, they were all natives? And what if every time a bird left the city, they were actually just seeding a native species, like a native burning bush or a native dogwood out in the countryside where those species have had a pretty rough go because of uh, persecution related to exotic species or just persecution because they're, they were weeds on the margins of our uh, farms. And then the last thing is to tell your story. I think it's really important that we tell the story of native plants and we talk about what the prairie rose is or we talk about the 12 species of oaks found in Iowa or tell these stories of this rich diversity of plants that we find here and make sure that kids know what a prairie rose is or make sure that people know what um, tall grass prairie plants are and why they're unique or the stories of monarchs. I think it's really important that we start to sort of ingrain that into the culture and connecting uh, back to this place and the plants that have been here for thousands of years. So that's my sort of wrap up slide. The last thing, uh, Susan mentioned that she shared the link to our invasive species resource. And you can find a lot of information about what we've talked about, uh, what I've talked about here today at naturalresources.extension.iastate.edu. Uh, and there's other resources available as well, like through the Iowa Living Roadside Trust Fund, the Tallgrass Prairie Center at University of Northern Iowa, in the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. So thanks for your time on that. And I'm looking forward to jumping into questions now. Yay, thanks, Adam. Do you wanna stop your screen share and then we'll just... Awesome, so it looks like, um, so I did, there were a lot of links shared in the chat box and I have been making sure that those are posted to Twitter. Um, and so folks can see that even if you're not on Twitter, you should be able to see those and access some of those. And um, I will share, again, the, the horticulture and home pest newsletter website is really fantastic. Um, so one resource that we have here is called Gardening for Butterflies. So that's a really good one that would back up a lot of what Adam is saying. Um, and then another one is this article about planting natives to attract beneficial insects, which also talks about some other species that I got excited about and found ways to incorporate. Um, and then I think this is the one that you mentioned, yep. Adam, about native milkweeds. Um, so there's a lot of good, good stuff out there that I think folks can share. Yeah. <clears throat> I have one friend who said, I want to be a part of the master gardener training, but I really like native plants. And I was like, why is that but in there? Like there's yeah. a lot of, I think a lot of master gardener volunteers are really into native plants and folks hold plant sales. So that's a chance to give, give stuff away. 
So I will jump into the Q and A here um, and try to kind of keep caught up. And Susan, I trust you'll help me out with what's going on in the chat too. I see there's a lot in there, and I um, we'll we'll get back and forth and get some questions answered. So perfect. Um, one question is a great question I see here to the comment above: Are all exotics automatically considered invasive? And no, and all invasives aren't necessarily exotics too. You would find that answer on our website. We talk about that a little bit. The easiest example of a native invasive species is Eastern red cedar. If you're trying to keep a pasture uh, and you find Eastern red cedar can be a real problematic invasive species, even though it's native. And so, um, and not all exotic species are inclined towards invading. And so an example that I know is a safe one is like hostas. Um, I don't, hostas don't find a way to invade natural areas. I don't see them as a real problem in that way. The only sort of problem with exotic species that don't invade natural areas is the that they don't host many insects or essentially, or they may not be an ideal forage. Uh, but there's definitely what we call benign exotic species and hosta is like a great example of a benign exotic species. So I see some questions about places to purchase different native species. These are great questions. Um, I don't know an answer that would apply statewide. I know from my own experience here in Ames that there's a couple of different places, people in, engaged in, in uh, growing and selling plugs of native plants. Um, but I, again, don't know that any of those are necessarily statewide. The um, Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge in central Iowa does have a native plant sale and that would be close to a lot of people just given its central location within the state. So it's worth looking into that. And then also just searching um, uh, online to find places that have native plants. I know a nursery here in Ames has a explicit section often just for native prairie plants. So that's pretty neat. And um, maybe a plug for the Iowa DNR where you can get trees, native trees for like a dollar. Yeah, that's a great point. So Iowa Department of Natural Resources, the state forest nursery, you can buy native trees. That, that's a really good resource and it's local and it does all that good stuff. I saw Sarah just share, shared in the chat that you could check with county conservation and that's a great point. Um, county conservation would be really tuned into that and some of them would even have uh, native plants, I suspect, as plugs to, sale, to sell. Um, There's a question there in there about birds, Adam. Okay, I gotta find it. Uh, do you want to read it? Sure, sure. So um, the question is, what would be, oh, sorry. Oh no, where did the bird question go? What are good native plants for hummingbirds or other birds? Yeah, good question. Um, a different answer for hummingbirds and other birds. Hummingbirds, of course, are unique. There's not many other birds, Baltimore Orioles to an extent, but not many other birds that eat nectar. Um, and so hummingbirds are, of course, looking for good nectar sources. Um, the one that comes to mind, like long tubular native flowers is what we kind of say. Um, trumpet creeper is a vine that can be good uh, for hummingbirds and um, cardinal flower comes to mind as well. Um, there's other examples that hummingbirds will take advantage of, uh, but I don't know a lot of those off the top of my head. As far as other birds, um, so woody woody native woody plants are really good for birds they provide nesting locations and they also provide the host locations for all those caterpillars like most caterpillars are adapted to uh, woody plants not all but many uh, so native shrubs can be a really good uh, landscape element to attract birds and then um, a few birds like sparrows and things during migration can take advantage of like flowering plants that produce seeds and so here's just a comment on another thing you can do in your landscape is just leave uh, standing dead grasses and flowers through this time of year and into the winter to provide uh, forage for migrating birds that move through this time of year. Uh, there's a question, when's the best time to plant milkweed stems and plant wildflowers in general? Uh, there, you could find a couple of different um, answers to that question, it'll, it would be species specific often, but as a general rule for wildflowers like prairie plants, um, the 
I always say plan it the way Mother Nature planted it, which is to mean, which is to say, most of the time, those wildflower seeds drop on the ground, just on the surface of the ground during the late summer, early fall, or winter. And then through the freeze thaw cycle, they'll work their way into the ground, really shallow into the ground, and then grow from there. And so that's how we tell people to plant prairies is to do what we call frost seeding, which is either drill or broadcast the prairie seed onto the frozen ground. Uh, and that can be a really good way to plant some of this stuff as well. I can't say that I know necessarily about like starting them in pots or anything like that. That's probably a little too horticultural for my expertise. So we would have to find a real expert to sort of answer that question. Yeah, there's some questions in here about the how of like how to remove my burning bush or how to um, incorporate it. And one question that pops up that I feel like probably has to do with any space that we're coming into as a volunteer is the mix of ex exotic species and native species and your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, well, I would say if you're starting new, if you can start with native species in mind, I think it's the, it's the ideal it's the ideal because of those reasons that I just presented. And then honestly, I just, I hope others kind of buy into this idea. I just think it's cool to connect to these places and tell the stories of the plants that have grown here with people for thousands of years. Uh, and that's what native plants can do in a way that exotic plants cannot. Uh, and so that's sort of my opinion in terms of like educating about fitting into the environment and those sorts of things, starting with native plants. Now, if you're given in a place that has like a bunch of exotic species, like what do you do? How do you triage and find opportunities? That's where I would say, figure out the problematic ones. And so for example, I bought my house here in West Ames in 2016 and it, one portion of the yard was overrun with bush honeysuckle. And bush honeysuckle is a real problematic invasive. In fact, I would say it's probably the number one most problematic invasive in Iowa. So it had to go. It wasn't going to be on this wildlife biologist's property. But I still have other species of exotic uh, plants that are hanging on out there that to me are mostly benign. So I triage essentially, essentially and then I always try to bring new native plants uh, back in. And so that's kind of what I would say could be the, the approach. And I Again, bet most that, in, go ahead, Susan. Oh, I was just gonna say through that transition, you're probably showing people that, you know, native species does not mean that my yard is overrun with weeds. It means like it can be gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, I see another question in here about weeds. I you know Wildlife biologists have uh, rather different attitudes about weeds. Like uh, it's a pretty high bar for me to call something a weed. I have like an innocent until proven guilty attitude about basically all plants and have sort of a different aesthetic because I am interested in wild places and wild things. And so that's a little bit different, but uh, it is not true that native plants have to be unruly. It's that's far from true. And I think we could find many examples of native plants that fit nicely into designed landscapes. You can be intentional about like planting uh, things with clean edges or planting um, vegetation in layers. So you could plant like a row of wildflowers, like, um, I don't know, purple coneflower or something in a bed. And then behind that plant a, a row of uh, woody plants and behind that a row of sh short trees and sort of create a natural, a clean aesthetic. It's not necessarily how it would have happened in nature. That's not what I'm saying you need to do. It's more just applying landscape design principles, but just using native plants instead of using exotic species. So that's, I, I think it's a great question and it's definitely a concern. Letting the yard go, that's a different thing, you know, and to some people that's appealing, uh, but to others it's not. And I certainly understand that distinction and you have to kind of do what works for you. Um, but native plants can be very clean and have a very nice aesthetic. And they're also low maintenance because they're, used to the situation, right? So they can, yeah, they can often be low maintenance. There is the challenge because native plants have many more pests. Like I always joke, like you can buy barberry at a gas station and like anybody could keep it alive. That's because it's native to Asia and there's no pests here that affect it, right? And so in some ways you understand why these systems favor um, proliferation of exotic species because it is oftentimes easier to keep an exotic species away. 
But yes, many of our native plants are adapted to our soils, are adapted to our climates, and they can do well. You just kind of have to learn uh, which ones work and frankly, talk to real experts. I'm again, a bird, a bird researcher. Uh, I just dispatches from the natural areas. Yeah, um, and go ahead. Well, uh, some questions about some native species. I saw a cardinal flower. There was a question and it's definitely a native. Red buds are native in a beautiful landscape tree. Um, can you dig prairie rose out of a ditch? You bet. I did it myself this summer. Uh, I think it would depend on which ditch you were working on and how comfortable you feel with that. But um, I don't see much harm in that, though you would need permission, I think, to cover myself. Um, but I'm very much in favor of that. If you see a plant you like, uh, get permission and, and take it home. Is there a reliable list of plants native to Iowa that we could reference when selecting plants for our garden? Um, it's a great question, Carla. Um, the USDA plants database is like the definitive resource on this, which if you just Google USDA plants and you look up a scientific name in there, you're going to get an answer whether or not it's native or not. As far as a list, because there's so many that can sometimes be hard, but I'll point you to what Susan shared, the Horton Home Pest newsletter. If you search for native plant on there, you'll find a couple of really nice articles that have been written through the years. For example, like shade tolerant native plants or um, uh, um, prairie, native prairie plants. And then a few of the articles that I've written, I think Susan's shared those have, uh, I always sort of highlight native plants as well. So you can find those. Yeah, and we'll try to make sure that there's even more articles about native plants. Any yeah. last closing thoughts? Um, I don't know that I, I think I gave you my closing thoughts. There's only two questions here. Let me address Go these. For it. What would be a good native plant to plant in or near an aquatic ecosystem? And great question. There are one, there, it, depending on sort of how big the area and what the footprint of it was, you could, um, there's like seed mixes for wet areas that you could get. If it was a big area that you kind of just wanted to plant in the native stuff. If it's just a little bit like what grows well with wet feet kind of thing, um, burning bush is a great example. And in fact, just this weekend, I was walking around Lake Laverne here on campus and they have burning bush planted, or I'm sorry, not burning bush, button bush, button bush, cephalanthus. They have I was like, bush. is he going to say native burning bush if he's going to say that? No, the native burning bush would not do well in a wet spot. It is more of an upland thing. Um, button bush, cephalanthus occidentalis, world leaf arrangement, absolutely beautiful white Orbital, orbital flower thing. It attracts a bunch of insects, good for moths and butterflies, and it grows in wet spots. So that would be a really cool one to plant. Uh, and then if I buy a seed packet of prairie flowers in my local garden center, they may not, may not be all native right. Wonderful question, Elizabeth. The Sometimes things marketed as wildflowers are not native flowers, especially that seems to be coming more and more true as there's more like sort of public interest in this. And so it is worth checking. The other problem with some of those, like if you buy it at a big box store, wildflower mix, um, those are shipped from all over the place, you know? So I do, I do like to encourage you to try to find them from a local place and county conservation, to go back to Sarah's comment earlier, county conservation is a great place to do that. You can contact them, find out where they recommend getting seeds and things like that and, and go from there. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited to get outside and see native plants around, but I also want to check out all of these awesome resources you just shared. So yeah, thanks thank for that. For sharing them. Yeah, great. And thanks, folks. It was really fun to have the Q&A here, and, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your, your, set, your um, curriculum. All right. <laughs> see ya. Bye.